I'm Rob Lapuri, a senior editor at Gold Derby, here with Emmy winner Murray Butlett, who stars in Welcome to Chippendales and guest starred in The Last of Us. First of all, Murray, we might as well just address it now. You are now an Emmy winner. Uh, you've just been winning awards left, right and centre. It's probably no big deal now, but tell me what that was like on Emmy night. <clears throat> oh, my God. Um, I feel like you're maybe the first person to say Emmy winner Murray Bartlett. Um, to me, that was quite shocking in a lovely way. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's such a... Uh, uh, such a surreal kind of thing uh, to be called up onto that stage. It's so beautiful. I mean, I um, it was it was interesting because we'd been on such a, a long and wild road with um, White Lotus, which is what I won the Emmy for, um, because we shot during the pandemic, and then it was you know the Emmys um, that that the show was nominated in was you know two years later or something like that. Yeah. So it, it felt like you know, sort of the, the, the distant past in a way. Um, but it was, you know, White Lotus got honoured in many categories that night. I was the first one, which was just so kind of joyful and amazing to celebrate with this incredible group of people who I hadn't seen much because it was still sort of the, you know, I mean, I know we're not fully out of the pandemic, but it was, we were still sort of fairly in the pandemic so we hadn't seen each other a lot since mm. um since we'd shot the show so it was beautiful to be back with them and then it just kept ramping up because the show kept getting all the, you know wow. um honors in that night so it was it was an extraordinary surreal very very happy night yeah i can imagine it was and when we look forward now uh, you know something occurred to me yesterday it's i mean it's not rocket science but armand was killed in white lotus and nick He's murdered in Chippendales. Frank tragically dies in The Last of Us. I'm a little worried about you, mate. What's happening? You keep dying on screen. It's sad. I know. The thing about it is that then I get to go on to another, like, what's it, I've done a great job, you know? So there's, there is a, a silver lining, I guess, for me. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. There is something. Maybe I die well or maybe me, people see me as sort of a guy heading for, like, a a uh, untimely ending. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I'm not complaining because it's allowed me to kind of, you know, do some really great stuff and and uh, not not get held, not not have to stay alive as one character to stop me from playing the next. <laughs> exactly. And um, it also, you know, it's good. You're getting so much attention and praise, and I'm like, that's better than a kick in the face. So I'm I'm all over yeah. it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Um. You know, it also, I want to get a little deep for a second because it reminded me that you're really good at eliciting empathy and compassion through really compelling vulnerability. I remember back in the days when you were on Looking and um, other shows you've been in, like, mate, I remember when you were in the country practice, home and away in Neighbours, but that's a long time ago. Um, you're really good at that, really good at that. And um, I, I think a lot of that has to do with the rapport that you get with your scene partners. And so it was so evident with Nick Offerman um, and it was very much evident with Kamel, um, <clears throat> Andrew and Juliet in Chippendales. And so I'm curious what your perspective is on what's the key to being the best scene partner. Oh, wow. Well, thank you for saying that. Um, that's one of the highest compliments for me because uh, I feel like that's what it's all about. You know, you, I tend to over-prepare. <laughs> um, I think initially that came from fear of, like, not being prepared. But now I just love to dig in and, and, you know, find as much as I can and bring as much as I can to, to set. But then when I get to set, I want to, like, let all that be there and just, like, you know, acting is just, I mean, this is a, a cliche and acting 101, but it's, it is easy to forget that acting is talking and listening. And, and if you can bring yourself back to that and, you know, bring all the stuff that you, you know, all the re whatever research or whatever the music you listen to, whatever you do to prepare, bring that, but let the forefront be, I'm just going to like key into what this other person is doing. I feel like that's where my performance comes from. My performance comes from what am I getting from this person and what are we creating in this moment together? And they're giving me something for me to bounce off. And that's, that's, you know, where, we're sort of tri tri we're trying to create life happening in the moment, you know, on camera. And so if you can, you know, 
release into that and just sort of let yourself surrender to that um i feel like you've got a good chance of it feeling kind of real and and being surprised by what happens you know um because people are inevitably inevitably going to fire things at you that you don't expect and to sort of to go with that and see what comes from it i think is um it's the thing that is most enjoyable for me and i think it it when i watch things back or when i watch other actors that i admire it's the thing that i think i'm seeing of them fully like being engaged with the person that they're in the scene with and there's some courage in that i think and there's some mm -hmm. sort of surrender in that of letting go of what you've pre of what you've prepared and, and and being vulnerable you know and and seeing what happens sort of jumping off the cliff with your scene partner i think that's the that's the whole point for me that's and that's that's sort of where the magic happens or where it can happen and it's the mm -hmm. it's the feeling that you want when you're an actor of like really being fully you know like there in the moment creating something you know um spontaneously with somebody yeah and as a viewer it's so it's just so magic when you when you watch those two people or three people firing on screen and I think it probably takes a lot of agility as well for someone like yourself and you've been working for quite a long time and so experience comes into it life experience plus experience on set and I think that is a big factor I from my perspective, for, for Nick Denoyer, the character that you play in Chippendales, um, you recently scored a Critics' Choice nomination for that. Uh, and my sense from reading the reviews of the show was that people and critics really appreciated that your version of Nick wasn't a caricature because it could have just been a crazy like, guy full of swagger who cho uh, choose the scenery, but you were able with obviously the creators and writers and as particularly in the part, the pilot um, directed by Max Chapman, um, there's a lot of going on there behind the scenes and behind his eyes. And I'm curious as well then, what were you doing if you're a guy that prepares a lot to get into his head and understand who he is or who he was? Yeah, I think, um, you know, since uh, doing White Lotus, uh, the, some of the characters that come my way have been like these sort of larger than life characters, which is awesome. Those kind of characters didn't come my way before that um, uh, as much anyway. Um, and what's interesting to me about those kind of characters is, well, yeah, they're this sort of larger than life thing, but like you see larger than life. I mean, you see characters in real life that if you put them on screen, you might not believe them, you know, like there are a lot of larger than life characters in life. Um, but there's always, we always have a public face and a, and a private face or a face that we don't show to the public. And my fascination with these kind of characters is where are their vulnerabilities? What, are, what where does this come from? Is it hiding things uh, or is it not hiding things? But where does that not hiding things come from? Like, where what makes them tick? What's underneath all that stuff? And then finding opportunities to have a window into that, to into what's behind this sort of larger than life character, you know, whether it's a moment by themselves or a moment where you just see them hesitate or you see them panic or, you know, like flooding those moments, which I think anchors them in in something that feels human rather than like just sort of like a cartoon character um which can be super fun to play and it's very seductive to play a character like nick denoy because he's a choreographer and he is he was very you know like he was very larger than life and and like sort of he he sort of um created that image or really lent into that thing of like i'm a famous director and like even when he wasn't you know and like really projecting this idea of Nick DeNoyer um but you know then getting to play scenes like where he's you know dancing alone with this you know um yeah. scarf and like you know what the sort of the pain that goes into what he's creating and what he does when he's in a private moment and um the vulnerability when he sort of has to break up with um Denise um you know Juliette Lewis's character and what are the the vulnerabilities that he has with Andrew Reynolds character Reynolds character and um I think those are sort of the anchor points for for a, like a larger than life character and that that that's the 
the the joy of it for me finding those anchor points and being able to you know take a character that that might seem larger than life and make them relatable you know make finding those points where people are like oh i feel for this person or i recognize that in myself or i now i understand why they're you know larger than life or why they're projecting all this stuff um so yeah that's what i'm looking for and kind of trying to plot yeah i i didn't know a lot about him and i expected to not like him and that went away pretty quickly and i think the scene i think it was in episode one when he's dancing on his own in the apartment with the handkerchief was kind of initially startling because I'm like what is he doing and then I realized it was just a way for us to to see into his more private side and he's yeah. so, he's so introspective and really cares about the craft and so I, I'm, I'm wondering when you have to do stuff like that you know and also all the choreography all the body rolls and the pizzazz is that fun or is it daunting to put yourself out there like that on screen I mean, it's both, I think. It's re mostly fun and exciting. Like, I love to have a challenge as an actor. And if, you know, I'm playing a choreographer, I want to look like I'm a choreographer. So I just, like, you know, we had great choreographers that I was working with who tailored things for me, for things that I could manage. But then I drilled that stuff and I watched, you know, um, all that jazz and, like, watched documentaries about choreographers and, you know, like, I love that. I mean, there is, you know, there is that sort of element of like, oh, am I going to make a fool of myself or am I going to be able to do this? But like, it's a great challenge. You know, that's the, you know, we get as actors get to be other people and we get to, I got to like learn dance moves and pretend to be a choreographer and like, you know, lead this whole sort of like big sort of space of dancers through this routine. I mean, it's, that is the fun for me, but it's, yeah, to say that it's not daunting at some point would be a lie because it you're like, oh, I hope I can do this, but it's um, it's exciting. And, you know, that, that, that private moment with Nick when he's dancing, I mean, there's some challenge in, in sort of getting the moves and making them feel sort of organic, but I love what it reveals about that character. And I think it makes you, it doesn't necessarily make you like him, but it makes you understand his love for what he's creating like he's really invested and it's personal for him you know like he's just he feels it and you might not necessarily understand that when you're just seeing him ordering people around like you know on the rehearsal room floor but he like there's deep kind of love and commitment for what he's doing which i think is the case for for most sort of creative visionaries you know so it's it was like a wonderful thing for me to be able to um have that opportunity in that scene to show that side of him yeah we needed a lot of those moments because we i mean we know if you know the story of nick Vigenale, yeah, he's murdered by someone hired by steve banerjee and so it's an ultimately tragic ending and we know it's coming but when it does happen in episode seven um i, I gotta i found it so unsettling uh this the way that that sequence was shot and edited and a lot of it is, you know, we're really leaning on Andrew Rennells, who is a, a, such an amazing actor. But yeah. before he leaves the room to go to the bathroom, there's a you do a couple of inflections and uh, just, you know, you really don't say much at all, but you can see how vulnerable and raw he is. He says, I'll miss you. And then two minutes later, he's gone. What did you think about the way the whole sequence um, was laid out? Because it's pretty good. I... Love it. I mean, I think, you know, as we sort of talked about before, I think Nick is, was a very obsessive person, obsessed about being successful, obsessed about, you know, his creative vision and like, and manifesting it. And it sort of has filled up his life. And um, I don't know that he ever thought that he would find something like he he finds with the, the Andrew Reynolds character. And so when he does find that, I sort of later in our story, I mean, he finds it with Denise, but it's 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 sort of um, it's different because they're kind of their work partners. I mean, they're sort of the perfect partners in a lot of ways, but it doesn't for him. It doesn't drop into that sexual like sexually intimate um sort of bearing your soul kind of uh, thing to the extent that it does uh, with with the Andrew Reynolds character. And I think what's beautiful about that scene you're talking about 
just before Nick is murdered is that it's almost like he's just arriving at that point of really understanding what love is and true intimacy is with this person that just and and you sort of see it in those last few moments that you know there was originally it was written that um that Nick says Nick I think Nick says I love you mm -hmm. or one of them says I love you and and then we cut it um with the right we talked with the writers and they and they they cut it and uh or we all decided to cut it together and now they just sort of they say it to each other without saying it and I I really I'm really proud of that moment because I feel like you see that um and I think exactly you know it's like this sort of this he's just getting to that moment of like bearing his soul with someone and feeling super vulnerable in this like I love you I lo you love me like wow I never thought this was possible and then it's kind of snatched away which I think is what makes it so sort of you know I think it, it sort of adds to the impact of the moment and um yeah I really love that traje trajectory that 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 the writers created and that we were able to kind of hmm. write uh, yeah it's, it's genius like I, yeah I, this is the way that saying I love you would have been fine but this way was just got me and I think it's why this show has really resonated and um, people really love it. Speaking of, as we alluded to earlier, you guessed that in The Last of Us episode three. Um, I didn't see that one coming either and uh, I was blown away like everybody else. Like unbelievable. What, what an episode of television. It's one of the best ever and I'm not being hyperbolic here and I'm sure you've heard that a lot. When you read the script and then you're on set with amazing artists, you know, cinematographer Evan Bolter and and Nick Offman, obviously, um, what what were your thoughts when you were about to launch into that? Um, I mean, it's an incredible script, and we all knew that it was. And um, I I don't think I even had the full script when I was auditioning for it. Um, I think I just had the scenes, but there were scenes from sort of throughout the episode and I just I could tell how beautiful it was um and then when I read the script I was just completely blown away um and everybody was it was one of those very I've never had this experience before where you know Nick and I arrived um on set or to the trailers in the morning you know to before we went into makeup and you know we went into makeup and everyone was like oh you know like and then we get to set and everyone's like oh this episode like there was such love for that episode and such kind of reverence it felt like we shot over the course of a month I think um and it it was almost like the whole month was just this kind of hushed like we get to tell this beautiful story you know um it was uh so you know there was this kind of like excitement and trepidation of like wow this is an extraordinary script I hope we can do justice to it um but then you know Nick who I'd never worked with before Nick and I had a really wonderful kind of connection and chemistry and both loved what we were doing so much and as you said like Evan the cinematographer is just phenomenal our incredible director Peter Hoare um mm -hmm. and um you know Craig and and uh Neil watching over us I mean it was just it was uh, an amazing sort of coming together of really talented people with just this extraordinary script and this such a beautiful story so and but it was you know you also you never know how that's going to resonate or if it's going to resonate with people we loved it we love we had it was a very sort of special experience it was very emotional and we felt like what we were doing was um uh it it felt like it had some magic in it like it felt really beautiful and and even so sometimes you can feel like that and it doesn't end yeah. up that way on the screen but yeah, um that's right it seemed it resonated with people in the way that we hoped it would well beyond what we hoped it would really like yeah. to feel that the love that we poured into it sort of create this kind of wave of love that people felt um about the episode was it's just the ultimate kind of it's what you want as an actor, you know, or as yeah. a as a sort of a storyteller or some sort of, you know, filmmaker, yeah. TV maker, whatever. So it was, um, yeah, it was, it was a beautiful experience from beginning to end. And, of course, because it, uh, it contemplates what it means to be loved and to love, but in a post-apocalyptic setting and 
of course, without being too reductive, it's my final question, uh, you know, it was also dedicating an entire episode of this huge HBO blockbuster to a timeless and beautiful queer love story that was so praised by everybody that everybody was able to join in on and and it will never be forgotten. So final thoughts, what, what, how do you feel about that, that, we, you know, we can watch an episode like that and really love it. It doesn't matter who the two people at the, at the center of the story are, but it kind of does actually in this instance. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really beautiful thing. And I think it's very smart of the, you know, the, the creators and writers to, to, to sort of sneak it in in that way and not sneak it in, but like, it's, you're almost, you're just not expecting it when you're watching the show. I don't think that's the feedback that I gotten from people. And, and, and it was what I felt when I read, you know, those first scripts, like you're in this post-apocalyptic world, it's harrowing and it's, there's a, you know, human stories at the head of, at the, the, the heart of it, which are, are really beautifully, you know, done. However, you don't, you just don't expect it to take this left turn. So I think it's, it, it's disarming in that way because you can't put up defenses. You can't, you know, um, bring all your sort of judgments to any judgments that you might have about a queer story or a queer love story or whatever. I feel like it's, 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 it's so unexpected that before you know it, you're in it and it's a beautifully written love story. I think, you know, beautifully told with this, with this team of people and it's sort of, it just, before you know you're engaged in it and it's a beautiful love story whether it was between you know two men or a man or a woman or two women or wh whatever um it it sort of transcends gender and sexuality it's just this it's a sort of a testament to the fact that love can triumph even in great darkness you know and i it just it's it's such a beautiful story to tell. And I, you know, I think you're right. It's a, it's, it's amazing that um, it happened to be a queer love story that, you know, seemed to resonate with a, a lot of people. And, and I know with a lot of people that may not necessarily um, often resonate with queer love stories. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a, that's such a beautiful thing, I think, um, for people to connect, uh, to this human love story um, and uh, hopefully it sort of nudges people's boundaries a little bit and opens people's minds a little bit as well as just sort of you know um, making them believe in love <laughs> yeah good thing exactly in the in the immortal words of share um Mari thank you so much for your time today and congratulations on all this great work I can't wait to see what you're going to be in next thanks so great to talk to you always mm -hmm.